Hello, fintech leaders and builders. I'm Vasil Salashuk from Insart, and uh, this is our next episode of Fintech CTO podcast. And before we start, so please like this video and subscribe to our channel so you will be able to keep up with uh, uh, fintech and our next podcast as well. And actually, let's get started. And uh, let me introduce you our today's guest, uh, Anthony DeSanti. So he hello, Anthony. Hi, pleasure to be here. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for being our guest today. And uh, uh, actually, we have already recorded a podcast uh, with Anthony like three years ago, and it will be really great to learn more about uh, the progress that, uh, that you have done uh, since that time. And it's fun to see all the progress that you've made since then. The podcast has really grown and now you've got the video. This is exciting. It's a pleasure to be back. So, yeah, yeah, certainly, can... certainly. Yeah, Tony, so um, as I know, <laughs> you're a CTO of Shift Markets, okay? And, That's right. Uh, actually, Shift Markets, one of the main focus for Shift Markets is uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, brokerage technology, liquidity, risk management, compliance and also marketing services. And um, uh, you are almost 10 years with shift markets. And my question, yeah. like, yeah, my question here is, so can it be really interesting to stay in one company, like almost in the same position for 10 years? I never thought I'd be one of those people that ends up spending their life at a single company. And I've been at a couple of companies beforehand. So, you know, I didn't think this is where my career would go. But over time, Shift has proven to be a company that's really agile and rapidly expands into exciting new spaces. You mentioned we're doing a lot in crypto. The company was founded in 2009, which would have been very, very early days to have entered crypto. And when I joined them, we were focused on much more traditional asset classes. We were saying people up with FX brokerages, uh, commodity brokers, equity brokers. We would help them with more traditional liquidity agreements, uh, gang prime brokerage relationships, everything that's related to setting up more traditional financial companies and all kinds of different financial services companies, payment processors, brokerages, uh, different types of custodial services and settlement relationships, things like that. But more recently, maybe around 2016, 2017, we started expanding into crypto. And, you know, I wasn't going to leave then. That's when things really started to heat up. So, yeah, I've been there almost 10 years. I think it's 10 years in March. So, I'm three months away from my 10 year anniversary, but I'm looking forward to my 20 year anniversary after that. I don't see okay. myself going anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So look, uh, through the 10 years, uh, I'm more than sure that you had a kind of evolution of your role as a CTO. So maybe can you tell us what are like the major milestones in your career and you, the milestones of your CTO role? Like from the beginning till now, like what are, what are they? Wow, yeah. So when I started at Shift, I was the only developer and technical person at the company. And I started to build the tech team out from scratch. So they were much more of a consultancy when I joined them. We would work with mid to large size brokers across a variety of different asset classes and help them with very specific projects. But... After I was with them for maybe a year or two, we decided we wanted to start building out our own products, uh, products that would allow either existing companies to expand into new services very rapidly with turnkey solutions, or people who had experience in the industry that wanted to found their own companies to get off the ground running really fast. If you want to put together a financial services company, it's not something you can just do overnight if you haven't done it before. There's a lot of very important controls and governance that you need to have to do this securely and to be compliant with the different regulations that you might not even be aware of. So putting together a turnkey solution to help people get off the ground was a really valuable product that allowed us to rapidly scale the business but it meant we needed a lot more tech people than just me. <laughs> so okay. I think the first milestone was us deciding to 
build products and not just go in and consult. That really was a paradigm shift from trying to pr position myself as an expert to these potential customers that were large companies and coming in to help them build, refine their own products or to iterate on uh, their general offerings to the public to building something that was a scalable product that we could sell repeatedly and cross sell additional features out of and eventually upsell into additional asset classes or services, whatever it might be that we were looking at at that time. Um, so in the early days, you know, it was especially with the nature of FX or currency trading, it's a 24 five market. So it trades all day from Sunday night to Friday night, New York time. And then when we entered crypto, obviously that's 24 seven. So as one guy, I was on call 24 seven. It was, it was tough as a single person, but, and the first couple of hires weren't really helping with those sort of client emergencies. It was things like every customer needs their own website and the website needs to be differentiated from the other customers. People don't just want a clone of a template that looks exactly like all the other customers you have. So that was the first area we really needed to start expanding our resources and build out a web development team. Then we really needed people that could provide emergency support. If there's a trading emergency, there's a lot of money on the line. We need to build out this trading support team. And these people need to be able to handle high pressure situations, speaking clearly to the customer, explaining exactly what options are available and resolving the problem without intervention from anyone else. So they need to be well-trained and they need to really understand not just the product, but also the financial market that the product is operating in. So yeah. that was another really challenging area. But ultimately, uh, as we started to bring on these additional members of the team that could focus on different areas, we reached a level of scale where we could start to have team leads for different teams. And I'd say that's a real milestone when it's no longer you with a team of people reporting to you and you start to have teams below you. That changes the dynamic. Now you have to start to build mm -hmm. out infrastructure that empowers the team leads to manage their teams appropriately, build incentive structures that retain your, ideally everyone, but certainly the superstars on the team. Um, and also ways to deal with conflict resolution and the other issues that are just people issues. You know, it's got nothing to do with technology. You just, you got a lot of people and um, especially us, we started expanding remotely. So we're based out of New York, but we have a lot of developers in Ukraine, Poland, other parts of Europe, uh, Cyprus, Malta, Sweden. And then we started expanding around the Americas as well. So we have people in Canada, down in South America, Brazil, um, and now all over the place because we need to be 24 seven. So we really can't have a gap in our coverage at all. Uh, India, Philippines, uh, Hong Kong, you know, all over Australia, we just Argentina, we have people all over and that really creates a lot of logistical challenges for building the team. It's a lot easier when everyone's in one office, not that offices are a thing anymore, really. Yes. But, you know, there's a lot of challenges there. So a uh, definite milestone was starting to build out teams that needed to operate independently without me being directly involved, like not even joining standups anymore. That was another major milestone, I would say. Because when we first had teams, I still joined all the team standups and I knew every member of the team. But as we started to get more and more teams, it became unrealistic for me to join the front end web team, the mobile team, the back end services team, the blockchain team, the platform engineering team, like all of these standups. And a lot of them happen at the same time too. Like, you know, it's just not possible to join and know everyone. So I think each level of scale is where it really feels like there's a, a new set of challenges that you need to overcome and a new set of solutions you need to be able to implement. So, mm -hmm. So yeah. how big is the team right now? 
just understand uh, this, this I think scale. the team's around 50 guy, 50 people. Um, I'm not sure mm -hmm. exactly because we're constantly bringing new people in and uh, occasionally people are cycling out. We don't lose too many people, but you can't hold on to everyone all the time. But I think we've got about 50 so, people. So how, how do you structure the team, uh, the whole team? So the team is broken into i mean there's some questions of like who exactly is on the technology team but we've got our okay. engineering team which i'll talk about the engineering structure but there's also the product team and the project management team and these are three separate teams that don't have direct reporting lines they report up to me but they don't uh report to each other at all although they collaborate closely so the uh, product team is a little smaller because that's uh, you need a lot more engineers per product than you need product manager per product. So uh, okay. the product team's a little smaller, and they report up to the senior vice president of product and engineering. The project management team is a little larger than the product team, and they have a vice president of project management above them who also reports up to the SVP of product and engineering. And then the engineering team is much larger. They ultimately also report up to the SVP. Um, and I have a couple other teams I manage just because there's three executives and we all have to wear a couple hats. So this is just one section of my role, but the, this is the most important and definitely the largest team that I manage. <clears throat> um, for the engineering team, this is the deepest department at the company because being a FinTech company, you have a lot of engineers and that's the, that's yes, the heart definitely. of the company. Yeah, it drives everything. So we divide the team into three main areas. There's the back end services team, the front end team, and the platform engineering team, or what might traditionally be called DevOps. So those are the three main departments within the development team. And the platform engineering team, they'll have a couple members that are focused on either different product lines or different technologies that we offer. And they have a leader who has a full view of everything and is responsible for all platform engineering, deciding on what IAC technologies we're going to use, how the CI pipeline should function in a general way across all product lines. But there might be specific engineers who focus on an individual product, and they're the expert on how that product gets deployed or uh, might focus on a specific component of our deployment pipeline. Like we use Travis CI, for example, as the task runner. So if you need to do something that is complicated in Travis, there's someone who's the Travis lead. And he knows Travis inside out. He's the guy to go to if you got to do okay. something tricky in Travis. Um, so that's platform engineering. It's a small team. You don't need that many people providing the development platform for the engineering team uh, compared to how many engineers you need to have. Then yeah, we have correct. Conserve. Yeah. So look, uh, here is a question. Mm -hmm. When we talk about teams and we talk about uh, processes, what do you think is more important for a fintech uh, company to be successful? To have the right engineers? the right people or to have the right engineering processes in place what do you think is more important well without question the right people is way more important but if you don't have good processes those people aren't going to be happy you're not going to keep them and they're not going to be as successful as they could be they need to be supported by an organization that empowers them to do the best work they can do and I've seen in other organizations that don't function as cleanly that sometimes developers are given a very broad mandate and asked to, like, they may not have SREs. If you're a developer, you're just also an SRE, and you might get calls at any time of the day to just jump in and solve problems because you're the developer, so you know how to solve all technology problems. and. That's not really the case. You may have written the code for a service that 
someone else's deployment pipeline containerized and deployed into the cloud in a very structured way. And you might not really know what the host OS is or whether this is an ECS task or if it's being managed by EKS. And maybe there's a whole bunch of Kubernetes stuff that is sitting on top of the code you wrote. And it could be very challenging for you to step in and debug what's going on. You may not even know how to access the production logs. Um, but if it's a good organization, then those logs should be getting drained out to a central log repository where you can search across a variety of different log sources and be able to quickly identify what's going on. And hopefully you have a way to request managed access to the production instance if you need to pull like debug level logs off an ephemeral drive or something like that. So the processes are important. They allow the good people to do their best work um, and they, and ideally, everyone is given a mandate that they're excited about and that is narrow enough that they can really focus, not have this mental overload of having 20 different jobs that you know have been dropped on them by someone that doesn't even understand what they really do. Yeah, certainly. But who actually establishes the processes? Should it be actually CTO, development managers, or you know, the right people will be will be able to organize uh, themselves. So what do you think? So I always like to push decisions as far down the down the organizational structure as possible because they tend to like ideally the person who's impacted by a decision is having as much input into that decision and possibly making that decision uh, as possible. So if you're sitting four or five layers up, so if we look at one of our deeper structures, we've got our front end development team. So there's me, there's the senior vice president, then there's the front end lead, then there's the mobile web three and web two front end development teams, and they each have a team lead, and then there's the developers under that. So if I'm making decisions about what is impacting their day to day, I probably don't have the right context for it. I'm definitely not going to hear the feedback about the pain points I've created. You really want that decision to go all the way down to if this is about how Web2 front ends get deployed, it should be the Web2 team lead that ultimately makes the decision, but in close collaboration with his team. And hopefully, in general, in our organization, we don't like to have a very, like, it shouldn't feel like your manager is telling you what to do so much okay. as your manager is asking you what you need and helping you get it. You know what I mean? You know, yeah, yeah, certainly. Like, you know, like several years ago when we had the podcast, you told me that um, you allow different uh, developers to choose between different technologies. And yeah. uh, this is like some kind of freedom here. But uh, my kind of, and but my question here is, do you, do you still have this approach? Because to me, it looks like it, you could have a zoo of different technologies that uh, can be hardly orchestrated into into something something stable and scalable. So, but uh, anyway, what's your what's your approach? What's the strategy here? So, I think that approach was great for us back then. It helped us identify technologies that maybe we wouldn't have selected if we didn't give everyone the freedom to try out new things. And we do still try to give people as much freedom as possible, but I think everyone has sort of come to a consensus that there are certain technologies that are good fits for certain types of problems. And now that we have to operate at a level of scale, um, so we have many customers using our platforms on a white label basis. The end users have no idea that they're using shift technology. They just know that they have an account with this broker or with this payment processor. And our largest customer is over 40 million end users. And that's just one of our customers. So, you know, we're oh, operating at a level. That's yeah, good. yeah. <laughs> this is not uh, not where we were three years ago, for sure. Um, I think back then, maybe our largest customer had 500,000 end users all time, and maybe 300,000 whose accounts were still active. So, you know, it's it's a real multiple orders of magnitude change from where we used to be. And some of the models that we were able to get by with in the past, like having services just make rest requests to each other in real time. Uh, they don't scale very well. And we've had to move towards what we knew were best practices, but uh, are maybe more challenging 
architectures to work with where you have queues sitting in between services, you have explicit message passing, everything is running in a cluster with horizontal scalability, everything's deployed into multiple availability zones, and they have you know, a load balancer saying in front of them, we have API gateways that sit between services so that lateral movement, if something were compromised, is no longer possible. And we also have to comply with security standards that we always you know, chose what we felt were security best practices, but now we have to go through audits and we have to be in compliance with very specific security standards. So some of that freedom has had to take us uh, a back seat and we do have certain structures that do need to be followed, but we still allow developers to work in the language that they prefer. Most of our code is in TypeScript or C Sharp. We do have some Python around and then there's some DSLs for different smaller technologies. Um, whatever sort of local development environment you want to use, of course, that's no problem. Uh, we have developers running on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, and using a variety of different IDEs. You know, you've got your guys that are Vim and Emacs holdouts, and you've got your VS Code and your PyCharm and all of your more modern IDEs, and all of that mixes and plays nicely together. So we try to give everyone as much freedom as possible, but we do have certain security standards that need to be complied with. We do have certain architectures that are supportive of high levels of scale with high availability that just need to be done to meet the business requirements of the product. And we do have our deployment pipeline, which enforces a number of things uh, ranging from static code analysis to uh, the containerization model to the deployment architecture when it reaches the production cloud environment. And those those can't be changed, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So look, working 10 years in the company, most likely you will have like a super legacy system. So on the scale, like, and you have just described how you do all this architecture stuff, you know, different uh, different services talking to each other, etc. cetera. But uh, let's say on the scale of one to 10, so how bad is the technical depth right now? When one is very bad, like 10 is very, everything is good. So what I will say has been good about our approach to technical debt is because the company keeps moving and doing new things, <clears throat> the technical debt tends to be siloed to either previous generations of products or to products that are running just fine and we don't have to change the way they work. So if you're an FX broker today, we're probably deploying you onto a Windows-based single server trading platform. That's not something we would ever look at building today, but it's rock solid and it works fine. So we don't really need to change that. That works, it services that customer segment and it's gonna be what it is. And you know, occasionally we make improvements there, but it's really like bug fix mode at this point. That doesn't really need to change. On the crypto side, that's where we need our latest and greatest. And we've been doing major version iterations fairly frequently. So having released our first, uh, maybe our most flagship product in the crypto space is our cryptocurrency exchange. We've launched over 100 crypto exchanges and a lot of our customers that are using the crypto exchange technology aren't even doing what you would think of as a crypto exchange. They're a payment processor or they're a uh, wallet that just wants to have conversion capabilities inside the wallet um, or they're using it for tokenizing other real world assets that they're using the blockchain behind to have an immutable ledger record of all the transactions, but there's no tokens that trade on public blockchains. It's, it's really just to maintain this immutable record for compliance and uh, public disclosure purposes. So uh, with that technology, we're on version four. We're in the process of rolling our customers from version three to version four, and mm -hmm. we've released the first version in 2017. So over five years, we've done four or I guess three major version iterations. So that's about every year and a half, we make a major version iteration. Mm -hmm. And when but we do was a major it rewrite yeah. of the system, was it rewrite of the system, the full rewrite yeah. or not? 
uh, full rewrite with every version iteration. I mean, there's some okay. aspects that we started with a very monolith system. We exploded okay. into a very microservice architecture. And over time, we learned what services were tightly coupled just because of the domain. The fact of the matter is the problem is going to associate certain things that from a technical point of view, you might say, oh, I can just have these run as completely independent services. But if every time any of these services is involved, it's processing a very specific type of transaction that always involves both of those services, you're creating additional latency through the network uh, stack that has to be transited between the two services, usually with a round trip, potentially multiple round trips. And you're also creating a more challenging development environment for the developers. It's always nice to think that you've got this strong separation of concerns, but when you don't actually have that separation of concerns, when they are tightly coupled because of the problem you're solving, it's a lot easier to solve them as one problem. Don't turn them into two separate problems and have to reason about them independently when they are one problem. So we've started okay. to move back towards a more consolidated service architecture. And of course, there's a lot of copy and pasting from the previous generation when we're building the new gen. But there's also a lot of fresh paradigms like all of this queue based message passing that's part of our v4 architecture and that was not part of v3 so that's a big change yeah so look uh from different cto's i've heard about uh, that maybe you need to rewrite your system every four to five years and it looks like you're even more aggressive with that and, maybe too uh, aggressive <laughs> yeah and in many yeah but in many cases the decision is not only like a technical decision or like organizational decision it's all it's it's also about the investment that you will do for the full rewrite of the system so uh how do, how do you deal with that like how do you plan the budgets for for this full rewrite because you know may, in many times CTOs they just afraid to invest into these rewrites Okay, so <laughs> uh, the way that we do rewrites is by kind of going through a little bit of a crunch period and trying not to have a big gap between like, okay, product freeze, we're going to do a big rewrite, and then uh, we're back into new feature mode. New features continue to hit the old version of the code a little bit. Uh, we'll usually look for a customer that has a very narrow use case, but needs the reason for the rewrite. So for V4, it was we needed to support much higher levels of scale than we were supporting before. And we did have horizontal scaling, but if a REST request uh, timed out, it would cause problems that would propagate, back propagate through the system. Like you know, there were a number of things that just needed to have a more reliable architecture that could operate at a high level of scale and support deployments, hot deployments, because it's 24 seven too. So you know, it's when you're using these large clusters and deploying new versions, it's like the ultimate version of a blue green deployment. There's 10 instances running and now 10 new ones are spinning up. The old yes. ones are getting connection drain. You're switching over. There's a lot that can go wrong during the deployment uh, rollout itself. So this new architecture is required for the level of scale that we need to operate and some of the some of the structures that we wanted to put in place. But we needed to find a customer who had a very narrow use case so we could start to use that have them use the new system before it had feature parity with the old system and whenever someone needed something new we would try to add it to the new system and migrate them to the new system as the way to get them live but occasionally features still hit the old system. That means they need to get ported into the new system. Um, but we try not to do this stop. And that just means that some developers that would normally be working on client projects are working on the rewrite, but we're able to take the rewrite and allocate it to a client project. So from a larger company politics point of view, they're not investing in the rewrite. They're just, uh, you know, some projects are getting a longer timeline than they might otherwise have gotten, but it's just business as usual from the rest of the company's point of view. So we're a little more okay. black ops on our rewrites internally. Like, yeah, look, I think it's really very great approach here. 
how to present this, uh, you know, on the company level with these rewrites, because uh, for the financial people, for example, I mean, like for like CFOs, it looks like you need to invest a huge amount of money for these rewrites. Yeah. And, the other uh, thing that the other thing that mm -hmm. helps a lot with that, though, is sometimes it really is necessary to service a customer and like an opportunity that's a big opportunity. There's a reason your current system can't handle what this yes. customer needs to do. Yeah. So we usually we want to do the rewrite like six months after the new version goes live. Someone's going to have an idea for how it could have been done better. And if we have to redo it this other way, but that's not going to get greenlit right now. But when the customer comes by, that is the proof that we really do need to make some of these structural changes that we weren't, that we didn't do in our previous version. That's when we get the opportunity to say, okay, we're going to move forward with it. But along the way, people have been thinking about this for a year and they've come up with, they've planted a couple seeds, they've gotten us ready for the migration, and then we're able to pull the trigger and really release the flood of developer resources on it to get it across the finish line. And it's supported by the rest of the organization because they really, like the sales org, wants this big sale. You've got the head of sales that's pushing hard for it because he's got a commission check tied to it. He wants this big sale to come through. So he's telling everyone, of course, we need to get this new version of tech. And I've got these five other giant clients that are going to need it too. Like there's a way to get the whole organization behind it by tying it to client opportunities. And that's what I found be really successful. So what are the, what are the other reasons for for this uh, reengineering um, activities? Because I I mean like as soon as you're in fintech in fintech I've seen like many different it can be like something with re related to regulations again as you mentioned new clients wanting some new features and you just can't deliver with the current product current architecture it can be uh, you know new new frameworks new libraries you need to upgrade them to the to the new versions actually it could be scalability but for for yourself what's what what are what is like the one major reason or are they different reasons or some major reason here so it has been different reasons across different generations um so when we're offering a product uh, within any asset class, we're usually looking to provide a very comprehensive solution to our customers' needs. And that means that we're more like an integration platform as a service than uh, a specific product. And that's how we always enter a new product category. We find all the vendors that we can use to get the product delivered in a complete turnkey solution. And then we integrate them all together into one product and give our customer a singular, uh, easy to use experience to achieve the business outcome that they're looking for without having to uh, worry about the fact that there's 10 vendors under the covers. But then you start to discover which vendors are not as good as you thought they were going to be when you got started. And you pick them because they were better than the other vendors. So that's where you need to start competing with them. You need to build their product. So you know the key yeah. is to have good people internally. Uh, start with as little investment into a new product category as possible so you can be an early mover and start to capture market share. Then you see what the real customer needs are and where the current competitors are weakest. And then you can strike where, you know, there's no, there's a big opportunity. There's a weak partner that's a critical vendor to this space and you see a customer opportunity. And when all those marry together, you'll get organizational support for the investment in building that product. And you'll see outsized returns from a successful build. So as long as you've got a good team, you know, you'll, you'll see the outcome on the back end of it. Look, so I, I agree with you that also like right people is even more important than right processes. You still need to have the right processes in place. And you as a manager, my opinion, is responsible for doing that. And for me, the right people is actually you need to, like someone, you need to like what you do. And actually, you need to know how to do it. Okay. <laughs> and Mike, but my question here is also about your you as a CTO. So you describe your evolution as a CTO. Okay. And you were doing different stuff. I, um, and uh, like 
you you may be wearing different hats still yeah and my question is what do you like the most like to manage people to write the code to design the software uh, system and architecture so what's what's your preference still so i've always had a passion for the information system design so that's one layer abstracted from the overall architecture how do we actually achieve what we're looking to do from a functional point of view like if you were just having the request inbound how does it need to go through a layer of transformations to achieve the result that you want to return and how can we do this at a high level of concurrency with high dependability and resilience. So that's the part that I really enjoy. But to do that means you need to understand the more concrete layer below it. You know, what are the technologies that you're going to be able to leverage to achieve the information system that you're trying to build? And this is especially relevant for financial services. Um, you know, a lot of technologies don't necessarily operate in such a transactional way, but financial services, you do, you can really abstract most things into transaction processing. And there's a clear transact, there's a clear transformation that's supposed to occur from the input to the output. And it needs to happen in a very structured way. And there's certain uh, restrictions on how the concurrency can operate as well. Sometimes, you know, you need to maintain a well-ordered structure. Sometimes you can do things in parallel, but you're not going to see a lot of like high level elastic map reduce happening in most fintech companies, unless they're doing data processing for analytics. Um, so I really enjoy looking at the technical system design and working on the architecture, but at this point, I'm mostly doing management. I have a principal architect and he does a fantastic job. Um, and then of course there's the vice president, the senior vice president above him who helps support his vision being distributed across all the teams because he really leads the services team. Um, and I get to give my input and, you know, I point out where I see new technologies that we could leverage and where certain problems aren't being solved the way they need to be solved and suggest why I think the solution is. But these days, as the team reaches this level of scale, uh, it's very rare that I'm doing even a code review, certainly writing the code fresh at best. Maybe I write a function in a task that then gets assigned to a developer and they've got this little function and they need to incorporate it into a service, but at least the logic for, you know, how do you execute a limit order in quote currency within a system that only supports base currency denominated orders. Okay, I'll write that function. The developer doesn't need to figure out that part of it. He just needs to get it implemented into the larger system. So it's fun for me when I get to do like that low level. I'm actually coding okay. it, but it's rare these days. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, like to keep to keep up with the technologies, doesn't CTO have you know to do hands-on work time to time? Uh, so what do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, these days, a lot of the new technologies are managed services coming out of the cloud providers. So following what the CSPs are releasing and how the new services can be integrated with existing ones, that's somewhere that, especially from with our more recent focus on security, that's somewhere where I've been leading a lot of those efforts. So I've been looking, I've been exploring the cloud security space, which is a little newer than a lot of the InfoSec space. There's not as much tooling around the cloud as one might expect. There's a lot more for on-prem devices and on-prem analysis than there is for cloud-based, like finding intrusion detection for a cloud environment, especially if you're deploying to a managed cloud environment like Fargate, uh, Good luck there. There's there's not as many tools as one might expect. So it's my job to go out there and find what technologies can solve our problems and to put together a proof of concept on them and to use them and make sure they really do solve the problem. But 
I tend not to be too involved after the proof of concept phase. At that point, I hand it off to the team that's going to be using this technology. I show them how the POC was constructed and what I was able to achieve. And then, you know, off to the races doing this at scale. Their job is a lot harder than mine was, but at least I know the tool can get the job done. Yeah, you know, my personal opinion is like on that scale of company, a CTO role is actually a manage managerial and leadership role. It's not like a software developer role anymore. Uh, so probably you still yeah. can do some stuff like just to keep up with the technologies. But uh, like, you know, from the on the company perspective, from the company perspective, it's it's a managerial and leadership role to set the goals to, you know, to provide the uh, you know, to work on the uh, and on the action plans to control how everything is going on, to set the strategy, and maybe help with some advices uh, on the technical level. But uh, again, if you if you have right people in place, so it looks like they should be responsible for for like architecture, etc. Yeah, when yeah. it gets that concrete, it definitely is not something that I'm able to focus on with my time these days as much as I love that stuff. Um, and one responsibility that didn't make it into your list that I think is pretty common for CTOs is there tends to be a large sales aspect to the role as well. Uh, anytime there's a big customer opportunity, they're going they're going to want to speak with a technology leader to a validate the security posture around the product and b feel confident that the technical leader has the the real concrete knowledge around the technology to lead an organization that will be full of people like that. And it's very common for me to have to get on the phone with the CTO of a potential client and, or maybe their CISO or, you know, someone else in their technology organization and kind of just prove myself as someone that they can trust. So that's a very common thing. But then during that conversation, they're going to present a bunch of technical structures that they would like to see implemented into their custom enterprise solution. And I need to be able to take what they're saying, understand how it would impact our system where the gap analysis, you perform the gap analysis in real time, just speaking to them. And it's not even like you're performing it. It just happens in your head. You know your product, you're hearing what the guy wants. There's a difference between some of those things. And you're like, oh, well, we could get that done by making this little change. So then I have to set bring that set of requirements back to the tech team. And we have a discussion around what those changes are going to look like. But maybe when they actually get implemented, they end up looking a bit different because people ran into different challenges or you know, we had a library already built internally that did the job. So let's use this different technology instead. And that's fine. You know, like I just need to help empower people uh, to understand what the challenge is and what a potential solution could look like. And I'd say that's a big part of the role too. You know, like uh, at Insert and my company, so actually CTO, solution architects and business analysts, they are more on the sales side of the business rather than on technology. So certainly they, they develop some proof of concepts and uh, they do solution uh, uh, solutions, uh, architecture designs, but they, they actually do a, a huge portion of the sales job okay so i agree with you like cito is on the sales side as well yeah so, although i don't want to i yeah, don't want to take yeah. anything away from our sales team our sales team certainly, does great certainly. work you know i just help support them certainly so i have read a press release um uh, you know that just published recently and uh it it, it was saying stable corp and shift markets to leverage circles payment solution and create cross-border digital asset payments. Mm -hmm. And actually, as for the Stable Corp, uh, I mean, I know they have several different uh, products as well, like a portal for digital asset development and management. And uh, it's uh, also for instant payments uh, settlement. And they have also like a yield as a service yeah, uh, mm -hmm. solution. Uh, but my question is actually, so why do you need to partner with a company like uh, Stable Corp? So aren't they doing the similar solutions that you guys provide? Uh, so 
there's areas where our companies overlap and especially in a industry like the crypto industry where it's so young and it's growing we don't really worry about where there might be an overlap between the companies and there might be some degree of competition we're more focused on how can we increase the size of the market and where are our points of differentiation going to marry well and allow us to deliver more value to the customer. So I don't, you know, I'll speak to where stable corp is strong that we are not and how that improves our product offering. And okay. of course I feel very uh, confident in our version of any areas that we overlap, but there's a good team over there at Stable Corp and they're doing great work, but where they really are excelling that is not something we touch is they partner with banks to produce stable coins and fiat to crypto stable coin conversion ramps. And that is critical to some of the new Web3 technology that we're rolling out. So they're able to like, the product that we're putting together with them is an end-to-end -end fiat to fiat solution that is powered by crypto rails, but does not uh, necessarily require the customer to know that crypto is involved at all. So they send a bank wire to a particular address and their recipient receives a bank wire in a different fiat currency at a very efficient conversion rate um, to their bank account on the other side. And all of that happens seamlessly without needing to have a relationship with, like generally, if you want to do one of these physical conversions, you're either getting really, really high fees. I'm sure many people are familiar with going through the money grams of the world and things like that. Or you're doing really large blocks where you might have a minimum trade size of a million dollars or something like that. If you're doing large real estate transactions, that's very common, for example. Um, but this allows you to do any size very efficiently. And what we're leveraging from Stable Corp, uh, they have a Canadian, they have a great relationship with a Canadian banks. So they can do the CAD on ramp into a stable coin that they're issuing then our technology is doing the conversion between the two different stable coins as an exchange marketplace. And then we're working with other stable coin providers on the other side to be able to do the other currencies. So we're building a network of stable coin providers that are very effective at doing the fiat to crypto on ramp and off ramp in the other direction, building mm -hmm. a standardized protocol for providing these instructions to us and receiving instructions from us. Although we'll generally just conform to their standards and then we standardize it as a facade in front of them. And then we're also providing the liquidity into the marketplace because we're a market maker. I also lead the market making team. We do about 25 billion a week in market making volume. Uh, mm -hmm. But so we have deep liquidity in FX and other asset classes that allow us to perform these conversions and we're gluing these connections together. So this is similar to what I was mentioning before, where we find the vendors that are effective in a space we glue them together into one comprehensive product and we try and deliver the highest level of value we can to the end customer and we think this is the first realization of the vision that we've seen a lot of the earlier entrants into crypto like maybe ripple for example claim that they were going to be able to achieve but we've seen the challenges they face we've been here so we started uh, creating derivatives on crypto back in 2015, 2016. This wasn't actually on chain stuff. This was uh, leverage margin based derivatives. But we've seen the space for, you know, at this point, eight years or so. And we've seen a lot of customer, a lot of companies come in with this general fiat to fiat conversion path as the, the pie in the sky, like, the holy grail that they're trying to target and not be able to achieve it. And we've seen why they've struggled across the different variants of it. And we think this is the solution that will actually get there. And we are very close to going live with 
our first couple customers and it looks really good. Um, of course, we'll be restricted to certain currencies up front and we're working hard on expanding that, but we've got a model that is partnership based. It's not us trying to provide a holistic solution across every country dealing with all their different banking mm -hmm. regulations and the challenges getting mm -hmm. the licenses and things like that. It's a partnership based structure and uh, it's built on top of really strong technology and on chain smart contract based technology that's not specific to an individual chain, but also mm -hmm. is a multi chain solution. So you know, I think we've solved all the problems that we've seen other entrants struggle with over time. If the person who actually has to hold the money is comfortable with this customer, then I'm comfortable with the customer. So then you just start paying for custodial services and you're piggybacking off.